Greetings one and all and welcome to the very first episode of season two of Time Traveler, the 1930s. Today's beautiful, demanding, sometimes abrasive, but always talented guest is none other than Betty Davis. I'm going to jump right in today. If you're celebrating Father's Day, happy Father's Day. If not, sit with me and just enjoy this lovely actress and all of her accomplishments. Ruth Elizabeth Davis was born April 5th, 1908 in Lowell, Massachusetts. She was the elder of two children born to Harlow, a law student and later patent attorney, and Ruth Davis. Her younger sister's name was Barbara Harriet. In 1915, Ruth and Harlow separated and Elizabeth, Betty Davis, ended up in a boarding school in the Berkshires for three years. But in the autumn of 1921, Ruth decided to take her children and move to New York City. She took the money she had been spending on tuition and enrolled herself in a photography school and took an apartment on 144th Street, where she worked as a portrait photographer. Davis was a patrol leader for her Girl Scout troop and during this period in New York City decided to change her nickname of Betty with a Y to Betty with an E. This was done in honor of a Balzac character whom she admired, indicating a mind already engaged in lofty literary pursuits. Betty attended the Cushing Academy, a boarding school in Ashburnham, Massachusetts, where she met a fellow known to his friends as Ham. He was Harmon O. Nelson and would become Betty's future husband. During her time in school, she saw a performance of Henrik Ibsen's The Wild Duck, featuring an actress named Peg Entwistle. Davis later told interviewers that Peg was the reason she wanted to go into acting. She made a first attempt by auditioning for the Manhattan Civic Repertory, but was rejected. They described her attitude as frivolous. Betty was 18 at the time and eager, but inexperienced with how to portray herself as professional. Later that decade, Davis auditioned for George Cooker's Stock Theater Company in uh, my hometown, Rochester, New York. The director was not very impressed, but still gave her her first paid acting assignment. It was a week-long gig playing a chorus girl in a play called Broadway. What followed, according to most sources, was a professional role in the Provincetown Players' production of The Earth Between, although it ended up being postponed for about a year. <laughs> Next, in 1929, came her selection as the character Hedwig in The Wild Duck the very same role she had seen Peg Entwistle play a few years prior. It was quite an achievement and fueled Betty's passion to perform. She got into casts in Washington, Philadelphia, and Boston, finally making her Broadway debut later in 1929, performing in plays called Broken Dishes and Solid South. The theater life was brief, however, and Betty made her move to Hollywood immediately in 1930. She was 22 years old and prepared to screen test for Universal Studios. She failed her screen test, but the studio saw fit to use her for male leads to test with, if you know what I mean. <laughs> she later described her experience to Dick Cavett on his talk show. She said she was the most modest virgin you had ever seen, but was expected to lay on a couch repeatedly and let men plant passionate kisses on her. She was mortified and felt as if she would, quote, just die, unquote. A second screen test came for the 1931 film, A House Divided. The costume people quickly threw a dress on her body that simply did not fit and exposed her bosom with plunging neckline. Upon stepping onto the set, the director commented loudly enough for the entire crew to hear, what do you think of these dames who show their chests and think they can get jobs? Classy. The head of Universal Studios, Carl Lamely, was considering her termination when one of his cinematographers named Carl Freund pleaded on her behalf, stating that she had lovely eyes and would be suitable for a film called Bad Sister. 
She made her film debut in this film in 1931, but Mr. Laneley was still unimpressed and thought she had nearly zero sex appeal. The film was not successful, so they threw her a small role in the next 1931 film, Seed. This got her a contract renewed for a few more months. She made one more film for them called Waterloo Bridge in 1931 before being loaned to Columbia Pictures and Capitol Films. She performed in Waterloo Bridge, The Menace, and Hell House, and after her now six unsuccessful films, Lamely did not renew her contract. Davis was planning to return to New York when actor George Arliss chose her for the female lead role in the 1932 Warner Brothers film, The Man Who Played God. Davis credited Arliss with giving her her first big break in Hollywood. She was reviewed by the Saturday Evening Post as, quote, not only beautiful, but she bubbles with charm, unquote. Betty Davis was signed to a five-year contract with Warner Brothers, but she ended up staying with the studio for 18 years. Davis finally married Harmon Nelson in August of 1932 in Arizona. They lived under constant scrutiny from the press because Davis made the modern equivalent of nearly 19,000 per week, whereas Harmon made only the equivalent of 1,000 per week. It was not a problem for Betty, and she did not judge Harmon based on their income inequality. But Harmon would not allow her to purchase a house for the couple. He wanted to save up and do it himself. Among other issues, Betty was reported to have had several abortions during the marriage. In 1933, Davis made Bureau of Missing Persons, The Working Man, Ex-Lady, and Parachute Jumper. Davis had amassed 20 film roles and was ready for a blockbuster. That came in the form of a film adaptation of W. Somerset Maugham's novel of human bondage in 1934. She played a severe and unsympathetic character named Mildred Rogers to critical acclaim. Several actresses had refused the unsavory role, but Davis jumped at the chance to show the breadth of her acting skills. Her co-host Leslie Howard doubted her abilities, but soon began to sing her praises. She took special pride in portraying Mildred's death from consumption, destroyed by poverty and neglect. She wanted it to be convincing because it wasn't a pretty life. Of Human Bondage was a huge success. Life magazine wrote that she produced probably the best performance ever recorded on the screen by a U.S. actress. Fellow actors petitioned for her to appear on the Academy Award ballot for her portrayal of Mildred Rogers, and the fight between the nominated actors and the Academy ended in big changes being made to how votes were cast in future years. Warner Brothers didn't reward her for her acclaimed performance, instead casting her in Housewife, a small picture, but that was followed by Dangerous, 1935, which received rave reviews. Betty was being recognized by the New York Times and other news outlets as the most interesting actress of their time. She was finally recognized and given the Academy Award for Of Human Bondage, but felt that the belated trophy was simply a consolation prize. She made a final film with co-stars Leslie Howard and Humphrey Bogart, then began to look for bigger opportunities. She accepted offers in Britain to make two films, then fled to Canada because she knew she was in breach of her Warner Brothers contract. She went to court over the battle, but the court and the studios regarded her as a naughty girl who just wanted more money. Betty simply stated that she would never launch a career working on a string of mediocre pictures. In 1937, Betty won the Volpe Cup at the Venice Film Festival, and her very next film, Jezebel, in 1938, provided her with the role of a spoiled Southern Belle and garnered her a second Academy Award. During the filming, Davis found that the director William Wyler was the love of her life. She referred to the period during which she filmed Jezebel as the time of her life when she enjoyed, quote, the most perfect happiness, unquote. Many speculated that she would play the lead role in Gone with the Wind, but even after a radio poll found her to be the audience favorite to play Scarlett O'Hara, it wasn't meant to be, and Vivian Lee was cast, later winning the Oscar for her portrayal. 
This was to be the most successful period of her career, placing her on the top 10 money-making stars list each year. Her husband did not have the same fortune in his own life and failed to establish a career for himself. He also obtained evidence that Davis had been conducting a relationship with Howard Hughes, millionaire, and filed for divorce. He said she behaved in a cruel and inhuman manner. Dark Victory was her next film in 1939, although she was so emotional that she considered abandoning the film. Producer somehow convinced Betty to channel her despair into her acting. It worked. Audience loved the film, and it was one of the highest grossing films of the year. She received another Academy Award nomination for her role as Judith Trahern, later citing this performance as her personal favorite. Davis was now Warner Brothers' most profitable star and received every significant female role. She was also listed at the IRS as the person making the most money in the United States at that time. She made All This and Heaven Too and The Letter in 1940. In January 1941, she became the first female president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. She was abrasive and committee members were disapproving. She also remarried in 1940 to Arthur Farnsworth. Next, she made The Great Lie and worked with Wyler for the third time in The Little Foxes. For the most part, Davis played unlikable women and excelled at it. The attack on Pearl Harbor found her selling war bonds. And soon after, looking to fellow stars to help her transform an old nightclub into the Hollywood Canteen, where she and a few big names would entertain soldiers. It opened on October 3, 1942. She was proud of her success at the canteen, and in 1980, she was awarded the Distinguished Civilian Service Medal for her work with the soldiers. She was urged to make women's pictures, so she gave the audience Now Voyager. The public enjoyed it as a distraction from the war, but as World War II continued, Davis's film choices were affected by it, and she took on varying roles such as Watch on the Rhine, 1943, and Thank Your Lucky Stars, 1943, a musical performance donating proceeds to the Hollywood Canteen. Betty performed You're Either Too Young or Too Old, which became a hit song after the film was released. Betty was in Old Acquaintance in 1943, and in August of that year, she was strolling down a Hollywood street with her husband when he suddenly collapsed and passed away two days later. It was revealed that he had a skull fracture two weeks prior that was the root cause of his blackout. At the inquest, Davis testified that she knew of no event where he may have received such an injury. She was distraught and wanted to withdraw from her next film, but production had already been postponed and she was forced to film Mr. Skeffington, 1944. She was erratic and out of character during the filming, demanding changes in the sets and script. Davis married her third husband, William Grant Sherry, a masseur, in 1945. He claimed to have never heard of her acclaim and reputation as an actress, and she liked the fact that he was not intimidated by her. That same year, she refused the title role in Mildred Pierce and instead made The Corn is Green. It was well received by the critics and made 2.2 million at the box office. Her next film was made with her own production company, the only one that was A Stolen Life in 1946, in which she played a dual role as a set of twins. Received poor reviews but grossed 2.5 million, her biggest success to date. Next came Deception, 1946, which was the first film of hers which lost money. Possessed was to be her next role, but she ended up having to take maternity leave. The part went to Joan Crawford, and she was nominated for Best Actress by the Academy. Betty gave birth to her daughter Barbara, affectionately known as B.D., in 1947 at age 39. She was enthralled with motherhood and considered leaving the silver screen, but did not. In 1948, she was cast in a melodrama called Winter Meeting. She found out that Warner Brothers had requested that softer lighting should be used to hide Davis's age. Many issues arose during filming and the studio lost nearly one million on it. She also declined a role opposite Joan Crawford in 1950, contending that it had inappropriate themes, but in more blue language than that. She was offered the lead role in The African Queen in 1951, but refused to film in Africa, so Katharine Hepburn played the role and was subsequently nominated for Best Actress. Betty's best performance was yet to come, however. She filmed 
payment on demand for RKO Pictures and caught the eye of Daryl F. Zanuck, who offered her the lead role in All About Eve in 1950. The director found her to be the most prepared actress he had ever worked with, and Davis adored the script. It was a match made in heaven. She established a friendship with co-star Ann Baxter and began a romantic relationship with leading man Gary Merrill. It is from this film that many of Davis's most quoted lines originate, including, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy night. Davis was nominated for Best Actress and received a Best Actress Award from the Cannes Film Festival, the New York Critics Circle Award, as well as the San Francisco Film Critics Circle Award. She was also invited to leave her handprints at Grauman's Chinese Theater Walk of Fame. On July 3, 1950, her divorce from William Sherry was finalized, and on July 28th of the same year, Betty married Gary Merrill, her fourth and final husband. They adopted a five-day-old baby named Margot on January 6, 1951, and a baby boy named Michael, born February 5, 1952. They moved to an estate in Maine where Davis enjoyed semi-retirement, making The Virgin Queen in 1955, in which she played Queen Elizabeth I. She and Merrill performed in a play together to lukewarm reviews, and Betty went on to make Storm Center in 1956 and The Catered Affair in 1956. Her career was in decline, as was her marriage. She made television appearances during this time and finally ended up filing for divorce in 1960. In 1961, Davis performed in a Broadway production called The Night of the Iguana and received mediocre reviews but she had failing health and had to leave the production within four months. She returned to make a Frank Capra film remake, Pocketful of Miracles, but the film failed at the box office. Next came the horror classic, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane in 1962. Joan Crawford had an interest in the film and thought Betty could play the part of Jane. Davis thought the film could appeal to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho audience from 1960, the film became the biggest success of the year and remains a classic to this day. Many speak of the feud between the actresses and of the games and annoyances they perpetrated on set while playing aging sisters. There is a link if you would like to follow up on those claims and the Crawford Davis feud. Davis received a BAFTA nomination for her role. As a Perry Mason fan, Davis was thrilled to be the first guest of the television series in 1962, and in 1964, Davis made Dead Ringer, in which she once again played twin sisters. She also made When Love Has Gone in 1964 and Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte, Robert Aldrich's follow-up to Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Crawford was to work with Davis again, but withdrew in the final hour. It was a considerable success and brought a resurgence of popularity to Betty Davis from an entirely new audience. Finally, she was cast in an Aaron Spelling sitcom called The Decorator. Later in the decade, Davis appeared in The Nanny, 1965, The Anniversary, 1968, and Connecting Rooms, 1970. None received positive reviews. In the early 70s, Davis appeared in New York City for Great Ladies of the American Cinema as a famous guest who would speak about her career and answer audience questions. In 1972, she played lead roles in two television films, but the networks declined, turning either into TV series. In 1972 and 1976, she also acted in supporting roles for two Italian films. It was said that she did not feel the co-stars afforded her the proper degree of respect. In 1977, Davis became the first woman to receive the American Film Institute Lifetime Achievement Award. After this appearance, she began to receive offers for roles yet again, performing on television for the remainder of her career. She even won an Emmy in 1979. In 1981, an entirely new audience came to know the name of Betty Davis when Kim Carnes wrote and released Betty Davis Eyes. It was number one on the top 40 charts for two months, and Carnes received gold and platinum records for it, which she promptly sent to Davis, who hung them on her wall. Another handful of films were made in the early 1980s, and in 1983, Davis received the Women in Film Crystal Award. Betty tried to film a pilot for the TV series Hotel in 1983 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. This was the end for her. Amidst estranged relationships with her children and alone, 
She underwent a mastectomy and had subsequent strokes, which caused paralysis to her left side and slurred her speech. She regained some strength with physical therapy, but her lack of health was exacerbated by the fact that she was a chain smoker, even in this late stage of life. She managed to write more than one memoir in which she discussed various family issues, in addition to tales of her extensive career, and accepted awards from Spain, Italy, and France, among others. But finally, during the American Cinema Awards in 1989, which is thought to have happened during a relapse of her cancer that had not yet been detected. She collapsed. She attempted to travel back to the United States knowing the end was near, but only made it as far as France, where she died on October 6th, 1989 at 1135 p.m. at the age of 81. A memorial was held for her at the Burbank Studios Stage 18 it was invitation only and very private. They turned on the light that was customarily only lit to signal the end of a production. She is entombed in Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills Cemetery in Los Angeles in a family plot. Her epitaph reads, she did it the hard way. And there you have it. There are so many links in the description, please, please, please check them out. There are a variety of film clips and interviews and a couple of articles and uh, some videos about the Crawford Davis feud. <laughs> um, all of it is there for you to enjoy. She was a truly remarkable human being and her films are some of my all-time favorites. If you get to find just one and watch it this weekend or next weekend, or when you have a few minutes just for me time, it will not disappoint. Thank you for sticking with me through this very first episode of the 1930s Time Traveler. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your support. And I hope you'll come back for episode two. And until next time, my friends, I hope you are happy safe, and incredibly healthy, and that you have a beautiful day.